Hello. The point of this video is to explain to members of Bible-believing churches how they can be effective in uh, evangelizing others. So we're going to be giving an example of a gospel presentation that, that might be given at someone's door. And I'm going to be evangelizing my wife here, who is going to be representing the lost person in this video. So may it be a blessing and a help to you in your attempts to share uh, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ with other people. Knock, knock. Hello? Yes, hello. My name's Thomas, and this is my friend uh, John, John Doe, and we are from Fill in the Blank Baptist Church. This uh, pamphlet here explains how somebody can come to know God and have eternal life, uh, so we were just sharing that with people. Uh, is that something you've ever thought about before? Mm, I guess sometimes I've thought about that. Okay. Great. Um, what is your name? Heather. Heather. Good to meet you, Heather. You too. Um, how do you think a person can know his sins are forgiven and he has eternal life? Do you think it's being a good person? Is it faith alone? Being baptized? Keep the Ten Commandments? I guess everything that you said, like just being a good person, trying your best. I think that's pretty good. Okay. 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 That's a very common view. Um, do you think that the Bible is the Word of God? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> great, great. It definitely is the Word of God. Do you have any kind of religious background or church that you go to or anything like that? When I was like elementary school age, I went a few times. Okay. I really don't go to church very often. Okay, okay, got it. I understand. Um, you know, while that view about being a good person is very common, it's actually um, not exactly what the Bible says about it. Can I show you what the Bible says about how a person can have eternal life? I, yeah, sure. Sure, okay, great. Um, now, I want to make sure that you understand, so I don't, I, you know, I could give you a little synopsis if you really have to go, but I'd like to be able to give you something, you know, to make sure you understand. Do you have some time so I can give you a, a thorough, careful presentation of this? Yeah, sounds pretty important. Okay, great, great. Well, Heather... Uh, one of the first things that, that uh, we ought to know is right here in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10. Can you read verse 10 there, please? For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law, to do them. Okay, thanks, Heather. Now, according to this verse, if we're of the works of the law, which would be trying to get to heaven by keeping God's law, what does it say we are if we're of the works of the law? Under the curse. Sure. Now, we might think, you know, if you're trying to keep God's law to get to heaven, you'd be blessed, but it actually says you're cursed, which is an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. Now, say, well, why would that be? Well, the rest of the verse says, explains why. Can you see why it says a person is cursed if he's trying to get to heaven by, by the works of the law? Because if you don't do all, is that what it says? Like, continue with not in all things which are written in the book of the law? Sure, that, that's exactly right. Very good. A lot of people don't, don't necessarily catch that <clears throat> off the top, but yeah. So Heather, if we want to get to heaven by being good people, like keeping God's law, we have to have perfectly kept everything in the Bible perfectly our whole life. Never done anything wrong, but always done exactly what God said. Never lied, never been unthankful, always loved God with all our heart, soul, and mind. How many people have done that? <laughs> have you? No, I certainly haven't. I mean, I don't think I've met anybody who's like that. No, actually, you're right. In fact, the following verse even says that no man is justified or declared righteous by the law in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. um, let me show you what the Bible says God's standard is, because uh, we need to understand what what he actually says the standard is. Can you read verse 48 there, please? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Sure. So, how good does God command us to be? I, well, it says perfect. Mm -hmm. it sounds a little bit like a explanation. Like maybe, is that really literal is that what he's saying yeah now? We, as perfect is god the father so we have to so god's standard because god is holy he commands us to be just as sinlessly holy and perfect as he is himself that's his standard 
<laughs> and that's why, you know, if we're of the works of the law, we're cursed because we don't meet that standard. Um, for example, uh, have you heard of the Ten Commandments? Yeah, like, don't kill somebody. Sure, that's one of the Ten Commandments. It's number six, actually. Uh, now, it's interesting. The Lord Jesus actually talked about that commandment. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think that somebody that, that was a murderer, that killed somebody, would he deserve to go to hell, you think? Yeah, I think that's a pretty bad sin. Yeah, murder's terrible. That's yeah, horrible. Terrible thing to do to somebody. Uh, but check this out, what the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 5, 21 and 22. Want me to read that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. What's that, Raka? Uh, that's an insult they had. In other words, you're angry and you insult somebody. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Yeah, so here notice, Jesus was explaining about, you know, we quoted the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not kill. And then he said, unjust anger, anger without a cause, is like murder in the heart. So, in other words, you get angry with somebody and it's the only just cause of anger would be a selfless hatred over sin, which is probably 1% or less of anger. So any, the vast majority of anger is unjust anger. Um, have you ever gotten angry with somebody for any unjust reason? Anything other than a pure, selfless hatred of sin? Um, hasn't everybody? I would say so. I would think so. Now, according to Jesus, what was that anger? What was it? What, what did Jesus make that anger equivalent to? Oh. Looks like killing someone. Mm -hmm. Murder, yeah. Sure, murder. Hmm. So that's, you know, just one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, another one of the Ten Commandments is, uh, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And adultery is a very, very wicked thing. Well, in the same chapter, look what the Lord Jesus said about that. Can you read verses 27 and 28 there? You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So here Jesus is talking about you know, adultery. And he says that one lustful thought is like committing adultery. And if you think about it, people don't just go out and commit adultery filled with all kinds of pure thoughts in their mind. They've actually done it in their minds a bunch of times first, and then they go out and commit this horrible thing. So according to Jesus, even one lustful thought is like adultery. Uh, can you say that you've never had an impure thought in your entire life? No. Okay, sure. Uh, how many acts of murder does it take to become a murderer? Just one. Sure. How many acts of adultery to be an adulterer? Just one. Sure, one. So according to Jesus, just from those two of the Ten Commandments, um, what would he say that you are compared to his standard? Well, I guess a murderer and an adulterer. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, we could go through some of the other ones. Thou shalt not steal, for example. If you even have stolen one tiny little thing, thief. Oh, other Ten Commandments, there's lots of commandments we've broken. We've fallen short of being perfect as the Father's perfect, way, way, way short. And in fact... So it's not like it's just the act. It's like the heart or the yeah. thought. Yeah, even the, the thought inward thing. thought is a sin. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. God doesn't just want... God wants outward obedience, but he also wants the inside. And if the inside isn't perfectly pure, we're guilty. You're guilty. And in fact... Uh, let me show you here how many righteous people the Bible says there are. Can you read verses 10 through 12? As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And can you read verse 23 also? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sure. Thanks, Heather. So according to verse 10, 
how many righteous people, how many just or good people are there that meet God's standard? None. None, sure. Amazing. Uh, all have, so, so there's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, they are all gone out of the way. So God has a way. This is his path. We've all gone our own way, away from his. And that's what sin is. Sin isn't just doing some really bad thing. It's any going away from God's perfect standard. Hmm. So we've all gone out of the way. We're spiritually unprofitable apart from uh, salvation, which we're going to get to. And, uh, apart, and left to ourselves, there's none that does good. Uh, no, not even one. And the Bible therefore says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the glory of God, that perfect holiness, is the standard. And we've all fallen way short of that. Everyone has sinned. And that's why we're cursed if we're trying to get to heaven by keeping his law, because we've all fallen short of that standard. And actually, um, the situation is, is even worse than that. So we've, we've committed lots of sins, and we've all sinned, but we're also... Uh, there's a reason why we've done all those sins. And this is the reason why sin is universal. Can you read verse 9 there? What do you mean, universal? Everyone has sinned. Oh. Uh, uh, what I mean is that, that there's a reason why every, there's no exceptions to this, to this rule, why everyone's fallen short, because you think, well, maybe somebody would, would make it and just, just make it. But our problem isn't just the acts. It, it's deeper than that. Uh, can you read verse 9 there? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So, Heather, what does that verse say the human heart is like? Is deceitful. Good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wicked. Yeah. How wicked? Desperately wicked. Sure, yeah. You can imagine maybe somebody drowning. Somebody who's drowning is focused upon getting out of the water. That's his, he, he's desperate. So he's focused. His soul, he, that's what he's, he wants to do. And the Bible says the human heart from, from birth is actually wicked and desperately wicked. It's set on wickedness. It, it's, it's against God. It's so wicked, who can know it? We can't even actually fathom. We can't understand fully the depths of that human sinfulness. And so the reason why uh, you don't need to teach little children to, to, to steal or lie or be, be selfish the reason why that sin is universal is because we're born with hearts that are deceitful and desperately wicked. And so that's uh, the reason for that, that universal sin. And that's also violating God's standard. God wants that not to be the case. And that heart, this is what that heart does to all of our actions. Can you read verse 6 there, Heather? But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Thank you, Heather. Now, according to this verse, does God say that our sins are like filthy rags, or even our good things, our righteousnesses? Righteousnesses? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So our sins, of course, are horrible in God's eyes because he's so pure and holy. But that deceitful, sinful heart that mankind is born with makes it so that even our best things are like filthy rags. Even the most righteous act that you've ever done in your life compared to the purity of God's holiness is, is imperfect. It's tainted. It's corrupted by sin. It's like uh, if you had a cup of water and you put one drop of poison in there, that poison would fill the whole glass and make the whole thing unacceptable. Well, that sin affects every single thing that you do, Heather, and it makes it so that even your best actions are like filthy rags compared to God's perfect standard. And uh, what that actually leads to as a result is explained here in Romans chapter 8. Here, there's the word carnal, which means fleshly. It means that, that what we're born with as, as sinners. Can you read verses uh, 7 and 8 there, please? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. 
And that word enmity means like somebody's the enemy of God. So here, that mind that's corrupted by sin that, that, that you were born with, it's actually uh, God's enemy. Your mind is, is in rebellion against God. It's not able to be subject to submit to God's law. And the Bible says, they that are in the flesh, which would be what we are until our sins are taken care of. The Bible talks about being born again. We're going to explain that later. But until our sins are taken care of, we're in the flesh, the Bible says. And the Bible says, they that are in the flesh, are they able to please God at all? It says they cannot please God. No, they cannot please God. So, uh, Heather, the situation is actually very, very serious. You've committed many, many individual sins. You have a sinful heart. Even your best things are like filthy rags. And according to this passage, are you even able to please God at all, truly please God? I don't think so. No, no, you aren't. I know obviously it's better to be moral than, than not and so on, but, but even your best things are, are unacceptable because of that sin. In fact, um, the Bible says that we're so set against God that apart from his grace, we wouldn't even want him. Uh, if you take a look at um, verse 44 here, can you read verse 44? No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So there, that sin nature makes us so that apart from God's drawing us to him, we wouldn't even want to come. We're so set against him because of that sinful heart. Uh, it's like, uh, what's something that you like to eat? Pizza. Pizza, sure. I like pizza too. Let's say that there was this just delicious pizza from your, your favorite pizza place right here on this, this plate. And over here I had some rotting food that was stinking. It had filled with worms. It was disgusting. It was moldy. And it said, Heather, here. Which, you can have whichever one you want. Take your pick. Which one are you going to choose to eat? Pizza, of course. Sure, you're going to choose the pizza. Did I, anybody have to force you to no. choose that pizza? No, you didn't. Well, in the same sort of way, that sinful heart makes us so that we're always going to want to choose evil instead of choosing God apart from his grace. That's how bad the Bible says, says you are. So that's, that's the first thing. There's four things that you need to know. First is this, this problem of sin, that you've committed all these sins. You have that sinful heart, and apart from God's grace, you're not able to please him. Even the best things are uh, like, like filthy rags in his sight. Do you have any questions about that? No, but it makes me feel really bad. You feel really bad? That's, you know, it's, it's appropriate to feel bad about something like that because it's, it's, it's a very scary thing. I don't, I don't hear this very often, this kind of, it's unusual to yeah, hear something like sure. that. Sure. And there is good news. I want to give you the good news, but first you need to understand the problem. And there's a little bit more. I want to show you what the penalty is for that sin that you've committed, Heather. Can you read verse 23 there? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, Heather. Now there, what does it say the wages of sin is? Death. Death, good. Um, and... Um, the Bible talks about spiritual death, which is separation from God, physical death, which is the soul and the body being separated, and it talks about the second death. I'm going to show you what that is in a second. But let me point out here first, it says that the wages of sin is death. Um, now, do you, do you have a job? Mm -hmm. Sure. Let's say uh, you're at your job, you're doing you know, whatever you do there, and they said, Heather, you are doing a great job here at work. We, we, we love the work you're doing. You are one of our best employees, but you know, your paycheck that's coming for, for this month, we're just not going to pay you. And in fact, we're just going to keep not paying you for a while. We want you to keep working, but you're just going to get nothing. And, and the wages that we owe you, we're not going to give them to you. But just, just keep working. W would you like that? No. You would like that? No, no. I mean, you could go to court and say, look, I earned these wages. These are mine. And, and this company owes it to me. They have to give me what I've earned. Couldn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what, have you, what you've earned for sin, Heather, and notice it doesn't say lots and lots and lots of sins, even one sin. What you earn for sin is, is death. S separation from God, spiritual death, physical death, and, and the second death. And now, notice it says the gift of God is eternal life, and we'll talk about that in a second. Notice it doesn't say that eternal life is a wage. It's a gift. But we're going to say more about that later. 
But let me show you what the Bible says the second death is, Heather. Because this is part of the wages of sin. Can you read verse 8 there? But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable. Abominable, that's abominable. people that do wicked things. And murderers and whoremongers. Yeah, that's set, that people that are immoral do uh, physical relations outside of marriage. And sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Sure. So, Heather, what does the Bible say the second death is? This lake of fire. Mm -hmm. Lake of fire. Eternal hell. Um, and so what have, if the wages of sin is death, that includes the second death, the lake of fire, what do you deserve for your sin? Um, hell? Yeah, that's right. And you can even see with these, some of these things earlier in the verse, murderers, we saw that unjust anger is murder. Whoremongers, even that lustful thought is, is, is you know, like committing adultery. Liars, if you've ever told a lie, and, and very few people can say they've never told a lie, well, liars deserve the lake of fire here. So, yeah, the, what you deserve for, for your sin, Heather, is, is the lake of fire. That's what God says. And this lake of fire is a very, very terrible place. Uh, for example, uh, this is what happens to, to those that go there. Can you read verses 10 and 11 there? The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image What's that? That's a particular category of lost people. It's, we don't necessarily need to get into that right now, but those are certain people committing a certain sin that's going to happen. And whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Yeah, same thing with that. That's something that's going to happen in the future. But, but what we can see here is that people in the lake of fire, they're, they're under the wrath of God, and they're, they're going to be tormented, no rest day or night, forever and ever. It's a very, very sad, very, very terrible thing. Um, but that's what the Bible says you, know, you, you, you deserve for your sin. Um, so hell's not just for really bad people. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, every, oh, everyone's sin. really bad. Sure. No, James 2.10, since, since you asked that, uh, right here in the book of James, chapter 2 and verse 10. Can you read that verse there? For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Sure. So here, you know, even if somehow, Heather, you were able to keep all of God's law, which none of us can do, and only broke it at one point, you'd still be guilty. Um, it's like if you had a window, whether the window is smashed in five different places or whether it's still smashed in one place, it's still smashed. You'd have to replace it. So even one sin makes you deserve the wages of sin, singular, makes you deserve the lake of fire uh, for your sin. Um, so that's the second thing that is important to understand. So according to God's word, Heather, um, have you sinned against him? Yes. Sure. What does the Bible say you deserve for that sin? Hell. Sure. Yeah, that's right. Um, if you were to die right now, where do you think you would go? Hell. Yeah, that, that's true. And it's very important to understand that, actually. It's, it's a scary thought, but, the, but that's the truth, Heather. And that's why I want to show you the good news, too. Do you think that God would be fair to send you to hell? He's God. I mean, this is, I think, yeah. Sure, yeah. That's good that you, you see that. Um, because this is what Jesus said right here in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. The Lord Jesus said, can you read, can you read verse 10 there? Here Jesus is called the Son of Man. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Good. So here Jesus said that he came to seek the lost and save them. And so once we actually understand 
And, and Jesus also said in Luke chapter 5, he said he didn't come to call the, the righteous people who thought they were good, but sinners or repentance. So once, once you understand, boy, I'm a sinner, I deserve hell, God be fair to send me there, well, then there's, there's some hope, actually, because see the problem. Um, like, uh, people don't go to the doctor unless, you know, typically, unless they're sick. And so once you see there's a problem, you're ready to hear the answer. So, so you know, once you, now that you see that, you're ready to hear the, the, the good news. And let me show you what the solution is to that sin problem, how you can actually be saved from hell. This is what, uh, what Jesus did so that you could be saved from your sin and from hell. Right here in 2 Corinthians 5.21, the Bible says, For he, and that's speaking about, about God the Father, um, hath made him, that's Jesus Christ, God the Son. Uh, so God the Father made Jesus to be sin for us on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he actually took our place and suffered and, and died for our sin. By the way, when I speak about God the Father and God the Son, the Bible talks about the Trinity, that there's one God who eternally exists in three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Are you familiar with that? I've heard of it. I've heard of that? Good. That's, that's who the biblical God is. He's one God, and, and he's only one God, but he's eternally the Father, Son, and Spirit. Jesus Christ, who is God from all eternity, became man, truly God and truly man. He, he, he uh, united a human nature to himself, so he was one person with two natures. He lived a sinless life. He, uh, after being virgin born, then he went and he died for a sin on the cross. He was buried. He rose again from the dead the third day and he ascended to heaven. And this verse is talking about what he did on the cross. So on the cross, when Jesus died, the Bible says that God the Father made Jesus sin for us who knew no sin. So he was perfectly sinless. And Jesus died like that, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So uh, Jesus... He didn't have any sin. Uh, we saw the wages of sin is death. Uh, but Jesus didn't need to die for his sin because he didn't have any. But he died as a substitute. He died for us. He died in our place. And he died uh, so that knowing no sin is a perfectly sinless person. So we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hmm. Now, remember what Matthew 5.48 says the standard was? How perfect do we need to be? As perfect as? As God. Good. As perfect as God. Well, Jesus died for, for the sins of the world so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. We need the righteousness of God. We need perfect righteousness. We need to be viewed as God, as perfect and holy as Jesus himself. But Jesus died in our place so that we could be saved, not by our own goodness or our own righteousness, but by his righteousness. Not by our own merit, but by his merit. Not by our own obedience to the law, but by his perfectly obeying the law for us and dying in our place. So uh, we need to be accounted righteous before God through what he did on the cross, not through, through what Jesus did on the cross, not through our own anything that we have. It's kind of like this. Let's say that you are in debt $100 billion. Do you have $100 billion? No. No? Okay. If you work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, could you pay the interest on $100 billion? I don't think so. No. You, it would just be growing more and more? Well, that's kind of like your sin debt, Heather. It's, it's, it's just this huge amount. It's bigger than anything that you have no way to pay for it. It's just impossible. Now, let's say that, that you were friends with the richest man in the world, okay? Might be, I think it's Bill Gates, but whoever it is. So the richest man in the world was your friend, and he said, Heather, I love you. I care about you. We're going to switch bank accounts. I'm going to pay off all of your debt, every single penny, and I'm going to give you my bank account. So now you are the richest person in the world, and all of your debt is paid off. And you are now extremely wealthy. And I'm doing this simply because I love you and I want to take your debt upon myself. If he did that, could the creditors come and say, you need to pay and, and we're going to do whatever if you don't pay? Could, could, or, or would you still be liable for that debt? Not if I don't have the debt anymore. No, sure. Not if the debt was completely paid off. Well, Jesus died on the cross for our sin so that we could actually have his payment take care of all of our sin in that way, and we could be accounted righteous based upon what he did. All right? That's why he died. And he was buried. He rose again from the dead, showing that his payment on the cross was enough to pay for the sins of any person who comes and trusts in him. Take a look at this verse right here. In this verse, the word sanctified means set apart to God, those that are, are, are saved people. Can you read verse 14 there? For they that say such things... Oh, sorry. Verse 14... 
right, chapter 10. Oh, right here. Yeah, 10 14. For Thank by you. one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Good. Thank you, Heather. So there by Jesus' one offering on the cross, those that receive that payment, those that are set apart to God by it, are perfected in God's sight. They are, God views them as perfect, and they're perfected forever, simply based upon what Jesus did on the cross, his dying, his shedding, his blood. The Bible says in Revelation 1.5 so that... So the perfect mm -hmm. that we need to be, mm -hmm. it happens forever. Yeah, yeah. Somebody who's received Jesus' payment and Jesus' payment has been applied to him, that person is perfect in God's sight and perfect forever. Not because he's so great, uh, but because Jesus' death and shed blood are enough to perfectly pay for the sins of the most guilty, vile person in the world. And, and those that receive that payment are perfect in his sight forever. Hmm. So he died as our substitute to completely in our place, they completely pay for the sins of the world. You have any questions about that? Sounds like a pretty good deal. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. That is wonderful news. Uh, in fact, the word gospel uh, means good news. And the fourth thing we need to understand is how we can receive that payment that Jesus made. And Mark 1 verse 15 talks about that. Can you read verse 15 there? And saying... The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. So here, there's this command to repent and believe the gospel. And we, just as I just mentioned, the word gospel means good news. It's the good news that Jesus died for the sins of the world and was buried, and he rose again from the dead the third day to, to provide salvation. So that's very, very good news. Now, our responsibility... Your responsibility, Heather, is to repent and believe the gospel. Now, repent is a kind of... Do uh, you have any idea what that word means? Have you heard that before? I don't think so. I just... Have, I've heard the word, but I don't know what it means. Sure. Uh, to repent would be to turn away from our sin and turn to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going our own way, and we turn from that way to His way. Uh, for example, I'll give you an example of repentance here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Here are some people that repented. Can you read verses 9 and 10 there, Heather? For they themselves shew, of, show, yeah. show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Great. Thank you, Heather. So here, um, the Bible says when these people received the gospel, they turned to God, the true God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. They turned from idols. They were worshiping these false gods. They turned from their sins. They turned from their idols. And they turned to God from their idols with the intention of serving God. So... They, they wanted, they were saying, you know what? Now we don't want our sins anymore. Now we want God. We want his way. We want to serve him. That's our desire. So we're turning away from our sin to God and with the intention of serving him and waiting for his son, you know, Jesus, who was raised bodily from the dead. So repentance is turning away from our sins and turning to God. And let me give you another verse that, that talks about that as well. So you have to stop sinning? Um, you know, God wants us to stop sinning, and when we come to him, uh, well, let, let me show you, actually, since, since you asked that. Check this verse out here. I'm going to show you one more, but look at this one since you brought it up. Read verse 17 there. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So there being in Christ is when Jesus' blood takes our sins away, and we become God's people, and those that belong to God in that way, they're new creatures. God gives them a new heart. He gives them a new desire. He gives them a new will. He gives them new, a different direction. So when we come to Jesus, we actually are, are turning from our sins to him, and we, we, we don't have power to stop sinning on our own. We're, we're, until we actually become saved, we actually are in bondage to sin. We're, sin dominates us. We're under the control of sin. That heart is deceitful. It's producing all these wicked things. 
But when a person comes to the Lord Jesus and is saved, then God makes him a new creature, gives him a new heart, new desires, and now he actually has the ability and the desire to serve God. So, you know, we can't do it ourselves, but when we come to Jesus, he gives us that ability, and we do have to want him to give that to us. We have to want that new heart. We have to say, you know what, I don't want these wicked things I'm doing. I want that new heart. I want the ability to serve God. I want to, my desire is not for my sins anymore. Now it's for Jesus and what he wants. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. And I'll show you one more verse that kind of explains repentance here. Mark chapter 8. Can you read verses 34 to 36 there? And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. Can you read verse 36 to Heather? For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Mm -hmm. So here the Lord Jesus is addressing a big crowd of people. And he tells this big crowd of people uh, that he tells them to, uh, if they want to come after him, if they want to become his follower, uh, become one of his people, he says, deny yourself, which would be turning from your sin. Take up the cross, which would be, again, part of that turning from sin. And the result of that, the result of that would be following. Now, the following doesn't save you. It's the result. But uh, when somebody denies himself, takes up the cross, he's going to want to follow Jesus. Now, in the first century, some, a, a cross, we just, people wear crosses around their necks and so on. A cross was actually an instrument of execution. If you took up the cross, you were actually saying, if somebody who's carrying a cross was, was going to get killed in a very public horrifying way it was a terrible death slow <laughs> agonizing public <laughs> and so repentance is we're denying ourselves and we're saying i want jesus to be in charge of my life now and i, I my desire is, is is to follow him even if it means a horrible death but jesus is going to be number one in my life i'm taking up the cross with the result of following him and you can see that in, in the next verse it says whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. So in other words, we want to keep our life. We want to just keep going our own way. We want our own thing. We're going to lose our life in hell if that's, that's what we do. But if we lose our life for his sake, if we say, you know, I don't want my way of living anymore. I want him. And we, we lose our life for his sake. We give it up. We're, we're turning from our sin to him. Then we'll save our life. We'll actually get to heaven inst instead of hell. And that's why he says in the next verse, what shall a profit if you gain the whole world, lose your own soul? So repentance is, is Jesus is going to be Lord now. You're turning away from your sin, turning to him, and, and, and he's going to be the one you're going to want to follow. Do you have any questions about that? He's more important than what I want, is basically. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's, he's going to be first, even if it will cost you a lot. Um, if, if it costs you your job, if it costs you whatever, Jesus is going to be first. That's what repentance is. He's going to be Lord. Now let me show you... Uh, uh, what, what belief is. Because remember that verse said, repent and believe the gospel. Uh, let me just show you one other verse about uh, belief here. In John chapter 3 and verse 16. In verse 16 there, Heather. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Good. Now, according to that verse, Heather, um, God loved the world so much that he gave Jesus to die for us, his, his only begotten son. Who are the people who have everlasting life, according to that verse? Whoever believeth in him. Great, right. Notice it says everyone who believes in him. It doesn't say people that believe, do enough good things, follow this or that. It's simply whoever believes in him. Those people have everlasting life. And uh, the Bible clearly teaches that salvation is not based upon what we do, but it's only based upon what the Lord Jesus did on the cross. So, for example, take a look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Can you read those verses there? For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not 
of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Thank you, Heather. So according to verse 8, um, it says we're saved by grace. The word grace means undeserved favor. It's God giving to us what we do not deserve. We're saved by God's grace. What is it through, Heather, according to that verse? What are we saved through? Faith. Faith, good. Trusting in what Jesus did on the cross. So by grace through faith, is it based upon what we do? Is it of ourselves? No. No. Yeah. It's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. Have you ever gotten, maybe for your birthday or some other occasion, gotten a gift? Yeah. Uh, hopefully. <laughs> so uh, if you got a gift, how much, let's say I was said, Heather, I'm going to give you a, uh, I'm going to give you a new Ferrari. Okay? It's great. I'm just going to give it to you. It's a gift. But you need to pay me $100,000. Would that be a gift? No. What if I said you have to pay me $10? Would that be a gift? No. How, how much do you pay for a gift? Nothing. Exactly. Who's the one that pays for the gift? Someone else. Yeah, the one who gives the gift pays for the gift. Exactly right. So salvation is the gift of God. We can't pay for it. Jesus paid for it on the cross, and we can get it freely as a gift, which is good because if our best works are like filthy rags, we couldn't pay for it anyway. We don't have a single good thing we could offer to God as payment. But God gives salvation to us as a gift. It's free. It's by grace. And verse 9 here says, uh, is it based upon our works, our good deeds or not? No, not no. of works. Good, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. If we could be saved by, by, if even one good thing that we did could pay for our sin and we could save ourselves, we could be proud to say, I'm in heaven because, man, I went to church every week and I was really great. But that's not the way it is. It's not based upon our works. It's by undeserved favor, by grace, simply through faith, trusting in what Jesus did. It's a gift from God. It's free, not based on our works, because then we could boast. All the glory goes to what Jesus Christ did on the cross. We don't get any glory because it's completely free, completely undeserved. And many people don't understand that. And we actually have to understand that. Um, well, let, let me show you why it's so important to understand that. Can you read verse 21 there, Galatians 2.21? I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So if, Heather, if righteousness, if we could be saved by keeping God's law, what would Christ's death be according to that verse? In vain. In vain, which means to no purpose. So in other words, uh, God would never have sent his son to die for our sin if we could just get to heaven by being good and, and whatever and keeping his law then his death would be in vain. So really, if we're trusting in being a good person to get us to heaven, we're trusting in, in good deeds, which we saw we don't have any anyway, but if that's what our, we're trusting in, we're actually saying no to what Jesus did. We're saying, mm -hmm. I, I, his cross, his death, we don't need that. My goodness will, will make me in, make, make me be able to get in. It's a terrible thing to say. We may not ever have thought about it that way, but really, if righteousness comes by keeping God's law, Jesus would never have had to die. And so it's, it's not based upon any of that, but only upon what Jesus did. And in fact, check this verse out here. Romans chapter 4 and verse, verses 4 and 5. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Good job. Let me explain what this is talking about. Now in verse 4, to him that worketh, so if we're working to earn something, the reward we get isn't by undeserved favor. It's of debt. We deserve it. Wages, we earn it. We deserve it. But the Bible says that salvation, though, is to him that does not work, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him, on Jesus. So actually, according to this verse, what is the opposite of working? What, what do you have to not do to believe? Worketh not, but believeth. Good, they're opposite. So you see, to, to actually receive the salvation Jesus purchased on the cross, you have to stop working for it and simply believe on him for it. Okay, being a good person is a wonderful thing, 
but you can't trust in that even 1%. You have to completely stop working and simply trust in or believe on Jesus and what he did on the cross. And when you don't work but believe, then the reward of heaven is, is by grace. It's undeserved favor instead of being of debt. And it says then that God uh, justifies the ungodly. We'll explain that in a second. It means to be declared righteous. And then it says at the end of verse 5, his faith is counted for righteousness. So simply by believing in Christ, by faith, we are accounted righteous by Jesus' righteousness. His faith is counted for righteousness. And then it's, it uses this word justified in verse 4 that justifies the ungodly. Let me show you what, what that means to be justified. It's kind of like this. Here I have a piece of paper here. And I'm going to write on one side, here's Heather. All right? And we've seen, Heather, that... Uh, have you committed... Have you, have you sinned? Yes. Sure. So Heather, sinner. We've seen a murder, even. Murder in the heart. Murder in heart. Evil thoughts. Okay. You ever stolen anything? When I was little, I did. Okay, sure. Sure. Thief. Stolen. Um... Do you have a, a good heart or a sinful heart, according to the Bible? Sinful. Sure, a sinful heart, sinful heart. And because of all this sin, what do you deserve? Hell. Sure, it deserves hell, hell, uh, death, judgment, and God's anger, wrath of God. Bad situation. So there you are. This is all that you deserve, okay? Now, I'm going to write on the other side of this paper... Jesus Christ. All right? So here's Jesus Christ. Was Jesus Christ a sinner, Heather? No. No, he was sinless. He was perfect. Sinless. Did he ever um, steal anything or have any ungodly thoughts? No. No, he was pure. He was holy. He was righteous. Did he have a sinful heart? No. Absolutely perfect in every way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does he deserve hell or does he deserve the blessing of God and, and heaven if anyone does? Heaven. Oh, yeah. He deserves, he deserves heaven. He deserves reward. He deserves God's blessing. Is God pleased with his son, you think? Yeah. Oh, he's very pleased. God is pleased, perfectly pleased with the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's you, Heather. Here's mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, Heather, it's like your name is crossed out here. And it's like Jesus Christ suffered uh, as, if, as if he were a sinner, as if he was all of this. He suffered for, for the sins of mankind like this. He did that, Heather, so that you could be accounted righteous before him. So, he could, so God could treat you as if you were sinless, as if you were pure, as if you were righteous, as if you were perfect, as if you deserved heaven. That's being justified, Heather. Hmm. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And when you receive his payment for your sin, Heather then God accounts you perfectly righteous like this. God can treat you because of what Jesus did as if you were sinless and pure and righteous and perfect and holy, as holy as him. That's what it means to be justified, is to be declared righteous before God. And so, um, for the camera. It's quite so, a gift. It is an amazing gift. Um, yeah, and so Jesus on the cross did that. Uh, he died in your place, shedding his blood, dying for your sins so you could be counted righteous based upon what he did. I'll show you one more verse about this grace and works things. Can you read verse uh, 11 there? Romans eleven six. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So there again, just, just to make it as clear as possible... So salvation is either 100% by our works or 100% by God's grace. And salvation, exactly. Could you just quick sure. definition? Salvation would be deliverance from hell and getting that new heart, being able to go to heaven, being able to be freed from the bondage of sin, being declared righteous or justified. All of that is, is, is what salvation is. And salvation is, is here. It's by God's undeserved favor. Um, it's not by our works at all. It's either 100% by God's grace or it's 100% by our works. And we've signed it's not that. So it has to be completely, entirely by God's grace. All right? And there's three sort of 
aspects to what the Bible says believing is. And you can see those in Hebrews uh, chapter 11 here. Uh, Hebrews 11 and verse 13. Can you read verse 13 there? These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Okay. Here's time about people that, that had faith, and we can see there are several things that are mentioned about these people. But it says, these people here, it says that they... Um, they, they, received the, they, they saw the promises, were persuaded of them, and embraced them. With the result, they confessed, um, which was after they believed. Now, uh, what we can see from this verse is there's three sort of aspects to what saving faith is. First of all, we have to know the facts. Like these people saw the promises afar of off. You know, until we came to your house here, Heather, I don't think you knew what the Bible said about salvation. Okay? Um, so you have to know what the facts are. Maybe somebody can get a pamphlet explaining it. So they have to know the facts before they can trust in Jesus. Then it says they were persuaded of them. So then we have to recognize this is true. Uh, we, if somebody could read a message from the Bible about salvation, it's, ah, it's, he knows it, but he says, ah, this isn't true. I don't, I don't care about that. Uh, but we have to know that they're true. But we can understand the facts and know that they're true and not actually have faith yet. Then it mm -hmm. says they embrace them. That's the idea of trusting or relying upon what Jesus did. So we have to recognize the promises that, that God promises salvation. We have to know those facts. We have to recognize they're true. But then we actually have to embrace Christ. We have to actually trust in him or rely upon him to save us. It's kind of like, uh, imagine if you were in a, a building that was on fire. And you were on the 60th story or something. You're very high, I don't know, some very high building. And the, these firemen were below. And there's no way to get out except jumping out of the window because this, everything was on fire below you. And they said, here, Heather, if you, if you jump out, jump in this net here. We've got this. This will save you. Jump, Heather, jump. Now, you could be on that ledge. And uh, well, let's, let's say you were in the middle of the building, okay, and you didn't know the firemen were there. Well, could you jump out and, say, and get, be saved from the fire if you didn't even know they were there? Not if you didn't jump into the net. No. And you'd have to know, you'd have to know the firemen were there, and you'd have to you know, jump out in the net. So you have to know the facts. There's somebody out there who can save me. Then you have to believe it's true. Like if you went out there and you saw those firemen, you said, you know, this is too far down. I, there's no way that it's gonna sit, that's going to preserve my life. Well, you wouldn't jump and you w w would die in the fire. But you could actually, knowing those facts and understanding that it's true that you would, what, would it be enough to know the facts and understand that if you jump, you're going to live? No. What would you have to actually do? Jump. You have to jump. And once you jump off that cliff, you are completely entrusting your life to those firemen. If they say, they pull it out, say, ah ha, and they pull it out, and you go on the ground, you're dead. Mm -hmm. So once you've jumped, you are now trusting those firemen with your life. Well, saving faith is like that. You have to know the, 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 the truth about salvation, understand it, and then you actually embrace or trust in Christ. You rely only on what he did on the cross to save you. And the moment you trust in or rely upon him, that very moment... He gives you everlasting life instantaneously the moment that you trust in him. Hmm. I want to give you one more illustration of that hmm. here in John chapter 3. We read John 3.16 already, but just a little background to that. Can you read verses 14 and 15 there, uh, Heather? And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So there, the Bible says you know, eternal life is by believing in Jesus. And it talks about Moses and the serpent. You think, well, what, what is that talking about? Well, let me show you what that's talking about, because that's, the Bible compares that to uh, salvation through faith in Christ. Uh, can you read verses, uh, start in verse 5, and I'll just, just point out a few things here in Numbers 20. This is what Jesus was talking about, this event with Moses and the serpent. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth it means they hate. this light bread. So here, Israel, the nation of Israel was coming up uh, to the promised land, 
and um, Moses he, and, and they were complaining. They were sinning against God. They were complaining about, about what, what God had done. So they were committing these sins. These complaining is really bad. And keep going. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Good. So here they were sinning and complaining. God sent these serpents to bite them. They were biting them, and they were dying of, of snake bite, these fiery serpents. And keep going? Yeah, please keep going. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So they saw there was a problem. We need, we need help from this. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass, that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Good. Thank you, Heather. Now remember, the Lord Jesus in John 3 said, this thing where they were looking at the serpent of brass is like believing in him and getting everlasting life. All right, so you know, what's, what's the point here? Well, Jesus dying on the cross, being lifted up to die on the cross, is compared to this serpent that Moses put upon a pole. Now, when you think about a serpent in the Bible, do you think of something good or like sin, Satan? Which, which, which do you think of? Well, wasn't it like a snake that tempted in the garden? Sure, in the yeah, beginning? sure. So it's like sin. So why would Jesus dying on the cross be compared to a serpent on a pole? It seems like a strange thing. Well, the reason why is because on the cross, God the Father made Jesus sin for us. So Jesus died. Our, put, God the Father put our sins on Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus is compared to a serpent here. A serpent of brass. Brass picturing judgment in the Bible. So Jesus is compared to a serpent of brass because God the Father put our sins on him. Now these Israelites in the wilderness... Here they were dying from snake bite. And what did they have to do to be healed from their snake bite? Just look at the pole. They had to look at the serpent on the pole, right. What, hap what would have happened if in the wilderness, if there was an Israelite, he'd been bitten by a serpent, and he said, um, you know, I've been bitten, and this is bad. I I'm going to stop complaining and just try to do better and reform my life, and so I'm not going to die. Would that work out? No. Why not? He had to look at the... Serpent. Yeah, God didn't say to do that to get healed. He said, look. Well, uh, similarly, or let's say somebody said, you know, I've been bitten, so I'm going to go to the temple or the tabernacle, offer sacrifice. Well, that's great, I guess, but that isn't what God said to do to live. He said, look at the serpent, and you will live. And um, just like that, see, they had this physical poison in them, and looking at the serpent healed them physically. Well, we have the, the people are born with a spiritual poison of sin in them. And to be healed from that spiritual poison, they look away from themselves. They turn from what their sin, and they look to what Jesus did on the cross. And the moment they look at what he did and they trust in him, away from themselves to what he did, dying as their substitute, dying in their place, shedding his blood, the Father laying the sins of the world on him. When they trust in him and look away from themselves, that moment, they're instantly healed. Spiritually, perfectly healed, uh, based on what Jesus did. Um, let's say in the wilderness... Uh, somebody was only was dying and he could only barely look and he just barely turned his head and looked at the serpent. And this other guy was just staring at it like, like this. Would one of them be more healed than the other? If they both looked, then they both got healed. Exactly. Anybody who looked instantly was healed. Well, whatever our sin problem, simply by looking in faith to what Jesus did on the cross, his death, the moment you'll look to him, Heather, that very moment, he would heal you spiritually, and you, you, he'll give you everlasting life. And let me show you uh, one other thing in, in that regard. John chapter 10 here. ten twenty seven to 30. Or ten twenty eight to 30, I'll actually have you read. Can you read verses um, 28 through 30 there in John, John 10? And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, 
and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Sure. And then the next verse says, I am my Father one. So here Jesus is talking about saved people, and he says he gives them eternal life. Now, can you have something eternal for only a short time, for half an hour? No. No. I mean, imagine, let's say I said I'm going to sell you an everlasting and eternal refrigerator, and it broke down 20 minutes from now. Well, that wasn't eternal. If it broke down 100 years from now, would it be eternal? No. We have to never, ever stop working. Well, God gives eternal, everlasting life to everyone who believes on Jesus, turns from his sins, and trusts in him. And so once a person's, and, and those people are in God's hand, they're in the Father's hand, they're in Jesus' hand. And so once a person's truly saved, he can never lose salvation because uh, it's all based upon what Jesus did. He perfects you forever, which is something you even brought up. So uh, the moment, Heather, if you all recognize your sinfulness, that you deserve hell, what Jesus did on the cross is enough to pay for your sin, and you trust in what he did, he'll save you, and he'll keep you safe forever, and he'll give you a new heart so you're going to want to follow him. He'll make it so that you'll have new desires. He'll give you the ability to serve him and love him and, and worship him and do, do his will. And he'll do that the very instant that you'll turn from your sin and trust in what he did in Jesus' work on the cross. Do you have any questions about any of that? No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, um, let's, let's just review it. One, you're a sinner. You've committed lots of sins, sinful heart. Even your best things are sin, filthy rags. You can't please him at all until your sins are taken care of. Because of that sin, you deserve hell. If you're to die right now, that is where you would go, and God would be fair to send you there. The solution is what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus died for the sins of the world, was buried, rose bodily from the dead, and, and that was a sufficient payment to save anyone who puts his faith in what he did. The way we receive that payment is by repentant faith. We turn away from our sin. We don't want it. We turn to Jesus. Uh, we can't save ourselves. It's only what he did. We trust in what he did. The moment we trust in what he did, he gives us eternal life and gives us a new heart. So we're, we're, we're freed from our sin on our way to heaven, and also have the ability to, to, to follow him and, and a new ability to serve him. Um, and let me just show you 2 Corinthians 6 too. This is the, the day that, that you should turn from your sin and trust in Jesus. Here, there's a few words a little bit complicated here, but he says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted. In the day of salvation have I succored thee, have I helped thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So what is the day that you should be saved, Heather? Now. 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 Because you see, Jesus would come back at any moment, and if you haven't turned to him and trusted in him, it would be too late for you. Uh, you. We don't know if we have another day. This could be your last day on earth. You never know. And, and also, uh, because we're so sinful that apart from his drawing us, we never even want him, if we know what the gospel is and we say no to it, God could just give us over to our sin and say, fine, I won't give you any desire anymore. I won't draw you anymore. And then you'll never even want to come. So if God has given you a desire, Heather, to turn from your sin and trust in Jesus, you should do that today. You should look in faith to him today, and he'll save you the very moment that you look in faith to him. All right? So this is the that last verse I'm going to show you here. Luke 18 and verse 13, there's this guy who... Um, can you read verse 13 there? And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And actually notice in, in the next verse, too, it says, This man, um, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. There's another guy who was a bad person there. But he, he was justified. He was declared righteous. So here... Now, now, you don't need to pray to be saved. You don't need to say anything with your mouth. What you need to do is turn from your sin and trust in Jesus. And the moment you do, he'll save you. But sometimes it helps people to pray. And if it helps you to pray, to trust in him, that's great. And, and, and that's a wonderful thing. But the key thing is whether, whether you pray or not is that you turn from your sin and you trust in what the Lord Jesus did. And the moment you trust him, the moment you come to him in faith, uh, John 6, uh, 37 says, He that cometh to me, I will, I will no wise cast out. The moment you come to him, he'll save you. So, Heather, what I would encourage you to do is, is um, as, soon as, we, as soon as I leave, get alone somewhere 
and come to Jesus. Put your faith in him. Turn from your sin and trust in him, and he'll save you. If praying helps you, that's great. But, but what you need to do, prayer or no prayers, you need to turn and you need to trust in what he did on the cross. And if you'll do that, he'll save you today. Is there anything that would keep you from, from turning from your sin and trusting in him today? I don't think so. Think so? Okay. Well, that would be a, a wonderful thing to do. Um, now, I'm going to pray for you, but that's, that, that doesn't save you, okay? That will not save you. You need to actually trust in him personally yourself, all right? Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for Heather. Thank you for her willingness to hear the gospel. I pray you'd help her to understand and that she would repent and, and trust in the Lord Jesus today. And I pray this for his sake. Amen. Okay, we're going to go, and I'd encourage you to trust in him today. Uh, also, uh, if you want uh, some things that can help you understand this more, this pamphlet here helps you understand your sinfulness. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards. Do you like to read? you like to read? Great. And this pamphlet, The Blood of Jesus by William Reed, helps show you the, the positive side of the gospel, how Jesus, what his payment is sufficient. These can help you understand more. Also, do you own a Bible? Um, no, I don't think I do. You don't? That. Okay. No. Uh, well, I have a, a, a copy of the Gospel of John with me. That's a great book that, that also explains clearly about salvation. I encourage you to read that with an open heart, and God will help, can help you understand more there. And we'd love to also set up a, a Bible study with you, an evangelist a Bible study to help go over these things with you more carefully. Uh, could we uh, maybe... Start that next week. Can we come back at the same time next week and, and maybe start that with you? I think so. Great, great. And uh, um, I'll, I'll get your name and phone number. Uh, and so I would, you know, you, can, you, you just would tell me whatever that is. So I'd encourage you, Heather, to, to right now go and trust in Jesus and what he did on the cross. Do you have any questions about that? I don't think so. No? Okay. Well, we're going to leave, and I'd encourage you to make that decision today. And then we'll, uh, Lord willing, we'll, we'll get to see you next week. And, and uh, you know, this tract also has our church dress. And we'd love to see you Sunday and to come visit us in church, okay? Okay, thanks, for, thanks so much for your time, Heather. Trust in him today and he'll save you. Thank you. Okay. The end.